This is the Life Group lesson for Sunday, July the 10th, 2022. It is entitled Proven. We are still in the book of First Kings. Today's lesson is about Elijah and one of his feats. I have my journal here with me today, and I want to share with you about five things that we can take away from learning about this story from Scripture today. As we begin, we are introduced to the prophet Elijah, the king in Israel is a king named Ahab, who is married to a queen named Jezebel. They are promoting the worship of a god named Baal. Baal is the god of weather and is often depicted with uh, a lightning bolt in his hand or walking on water. Elijah, we are introduced to in chapter 17, after Jezebel had slaughtered most of the prophets of God. Elijah pronounces a judgment upon Israel by telling them that God is not going to allow rain for about three and a half years. And this would have been a surprise to them because they worship Baal, God of the weather. And so then at the end of that time, Elijah comes to Ahab and he challenges them with this story that we have today to challenge the God of Israel, the true God, versus the God of Baal. Before we begin our lesson, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, as we look at the passage in 1 Kings today, help us to realize that worship of the one true God, you are the only one worthy of our worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing we want to see in today's passage is that there is no response from the false god, Baal. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 25 to 29. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Since you are so numerous, choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first. Then call on the name of your god, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull that he had given to them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound. No one answered. Then they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them. He said, Shout louder, for he's a god. Maybe he's thinking it over. Maybe he has wandered away. Or maybe he's on the road. Perhaps he's sleeping and will wake up. They shouted louder, and they cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom until blood gushed over them. All afternoon they kept on raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no sound, no one answered, and no one paid attention. So in this challenge, it is Elijah against a bunch of prophets of Baal. And according to his instructions, both he and the prophets of Baal would prepare one separate bull for sacrifice for each god and to place it on a stack of wood, but not light the fire. They would then call on each god, call on the one true god, and call on Baal to send fire from heaven. And whoever that is that answers, that's the true god. The people agreed, so Elijah instructed the prophets of Baal to choose their bull and to follow these instructions. Elijah is doing everything possible to give the prophets of Baal every advantage and to remove any hint of trickery or deception. By emphasizing the obvious advantage of the majority here, Elijah is reminding those assembled that they are numerous 450 prophets of Baal versus only one prophet of the one true God. Then Baal's worshipers prepared the bull for their sacrifice. Then they began to call upon the name of Baal, and they not only wanted fire to fall from heaven and consume the bull, they were expecting it to happen. Notice throughout this passage here the no responses. There is no sound, no one answered. Uh, the exact phrase is repeated in the description at the end of their efforts here. There is no sound, 
no one answered, and no one paid attention. So as we read this, the obvious conclusion is there is no response because Baal is not a god. Second thing we want to see in today's passage is that God made a covenant with his people. Let's look at verses 30 through 32. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near me. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel will be your name. And he built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold about four gallons. So following the prophet's instructions for the people to come near, they approached. And having the witnesses stand this close, reminded them and resolves that there's no chance of any kind of trickery going on. As Moses had previously done in the book of Exodus, Elijah uses 12 stones to rebuild the altar that had been destroyed. These stones represented all the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes named after the 12 sons of Jacob, who was then renamed Israel. This event was done on Mount Carmel centuries earlier, where he declared that God would be their God and he would be their people. It reminds the people of their covenant relationship with the one true God. Two times here, Elijah connects the altar with the name Yahweh, which is translated Lord. And that's the name that God revealed to Moses in the burning bush the name Yahweh points back to the covenant that God had drawn up with these people's forefathers. A third thing we want to see in today's passage is that our loyalty to God cannot be divided. Let's look again at verse 32 through 35. Elijah built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold about four gallons. Next, he arranged the wood cut up the bull, and placed it on the wood. He said, Fill four water pots with water and pour them on the offering to be burned and on the wood. Then he said, A second time. And they did it a second time. And then he said, A third time. And they did it a third time. So all the water ran around the altar. He even filled the trench with water. So instead of using the altar that the worshipers of Baal had used, Elijah repaired the Lord's altar, which Jezebel had likely destroyed as she went through all of Israel killing the prophets and trying to destroy the religion of Israel of the one true God. Using the repaired altar was Elijah's way of separating himself and the people from Baal. He wanted his worship to have absolutely nothing to do with the worship of Baal. And part of Elijah's charge against the Israelites had been that they had attempted to blend their worship of God with the worship of Baal. He knew that they could not be loyal to both Baal and to God. So the prophet is drawing a line in the sand essentially here, and he's saying it's time for the people to choose who they are going to worship, hence using a second altar. They remind us that God calls his people to worship and live for him exclusively. And believers must make this declaration in our hearts that is reflected in what Elijah says. My God is Yahweh. That's actually what Elijah's name means. Now, around the base of the altar, Elijah even drug a trench, and he prepared the bull for sacrifice. He put it on the wood, and then he had the people drench the bull offering and the wood three times, using enough water to cover the altar, drench the wood, and even fill up the trench. During a time of extreme drought, remember, it had not rained for three and a half years here, using this much water would have seemed excessive. 
but Elijah is removing any chance the people would have to accuse him of any trickery. Beyond that, he knew that the water would heighten the impact of the demonstration that was about to happen. A fourth thing we want to see in today's passage is that prayer affirms a personal relationship with God. Let's continue with verses 36 and 37. At the time for offering the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that the people will know that you, the Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you. In his prayer, Elijah simply speaks to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, which also means Jacob. By using this title here, Elijah is again calling Israelites to recall their covenant relationship that they had with God, which was started with Abraham and renewed with Isaac and with Israel. He's reaffirming his personal relationship with God as well, that he's part of the covenant people. Elijah presented to God a five-fold request. First, that the people would know that the Lord, not Baal, was God in Israel. Second, that the people would know that the, uh, Elijah was God's servant. Third, that the people would realize that Elijah had been acting on God's instructions. Fourth, that God would answer Elijah's prayer, meaning that he would send the fire. And last, that the people would realize that the Lord had turned their hearts back, meaning that they have an opportunity to repent and turn back to God. Fifth thing we want to see in today's passage is that the Lord is the one true God. Let's look at verses 38 and 39. Then fire fell from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was even in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord is God. He is God. Elijah had said, answer me, Lord, confident that God would answer him. Without that kind of certainty, Elijah would have never gathered the people, prepared the altar, dug the trench, poured the water three times, and prayed as if he thought he would be making a fool of himself before all these people. Elijah's actions reveal what he believed as well as what he expected. God would answer him. And after Elijah's prayer, the Lord's fire fell and consumed the altar and all that was around it. And two things we notice in the people's reaction. First, having seen this demonstration of God's power, they fell down face down. The same verb here is used to state that the fire fell and they fell. The second thing we notice is that they declare the Lord, he is God. Those who could not speak earlier can no longer be silent. They're proclaiming that God is the one true God. So in conclusion today, there's a few things we can take away from this passage. The first is that false gods will lead to emptiness and to disappointments. So we need to put our trust in the one true God. Also, God is honored when we express trust in his power. And last, God answers the humble prayers of his people. Thank you for joining me for this session in 1 Kings. I will see you in our next study.